beliefs in the classroom. Mary Troxell is an associate professor of the practice of philosophy, teaching primarily in the Pulse program. Her area of the forest in the academy is German philosophy. So she's a heavy lifter, hats off to you. Um, but that was the worst part of my philosophy training here is to read all those Germans. Um, and she has served as uh, co-chair for the Martin Luther King Memorial Committee for a number of years. Uh, and she has also served as faculty mentor for the Arupe and Halftime Retreat programs. Matt Kruger is assistant professor of the practice in my own department, theology. Since joining the faculty in 2015, he has taught in Pulse as well. He is the author of three books, including Spiritual Exercises for the Postmodern Christian, which Matt, I put on my reading list. Uh, I, have a, I have an online thing, the books I have to order, so that just went on my, my list. His scholarly research is focused on two main areas, spirituality and nihilism in Japanese con and continental philosophy and in Christian sources, which is very intriguing, I think. On top of all that, Matt is a supply priest in the Episcopal Church. We will organize our time this afternoon as usual. That is Mary and Matt will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes each. So let's say 20 to 30 minutes and then all of us can respond to them or to the reading that we've been offered. I'd like to, it's about six minutes after four. So I'd like to end our time together about six minutes after five uh, in observance of the master rule. Uh, so uh, yeah, the master rule in its total form is excellent conversation for 60 minutes and not a minute more. Okay, so so Mary and Matt, we are putting your hands. So Mary, I think you're going first, right? Yes, I'm going first. Um, and thank you for inviting me. And I'm, I was excited about this because I'm excited for after I get done talking to hear everybody else. Um, so it, when thinking about assignments, and I, I'm glad that we went last because I so much of what people have said in former um, th these sessions formerly have been really helpful and. And one of the things I'm always thinking about is something that um, Megan Sweeney brought up in our, our first meeting together, um, which is about being sensitive and um, to students' different social identities. Um, so the way I craft assignments, um, being a sensitive to those identities, and that's also going to affect um, learning goals. You know, when we make assignments, we're thinking about learning goals, but my learning goals are going to be a little different. Um, in terms of students' social locations. So for instance, for white students, um, a lot of white students don't recognize themselves as white, as racialized. Um, and a lot of the work is to help them understand their own racial identity and the advantages that confers. That's not a, necessarily a learning goal for, for most students of color who are more aware of their, their racial identities and, and how racism operates or how white supremacy operates. Um, so when I think about the, um, so when I think about assignments, I'm, I'm thinking about my own pedagogy. I'm thinking about both the, the structure of the assignments being anti-racist and also the content of the assignment. Um, so there's, there's some hazards I try to avoid, I guess, when crafting assignments. Um, and, and I think it's important to keep in mind or something that I always keep in mind that what I ask students to do in terms of discussion is different from what I ask students to do in terms of written work. Because discussion you can opt in and out of, you have a lot more control about the ways you contribute. But in a, in a school like BC where students are very concerned with their grades, um, there, there's a lot more rigidity to how a student performs a writing assignment. Um, so I don't want to, yeah, so I, I have to be sensitive to that. So some hazards that, I, that I'm always thinking about um, is I don't want students to require students to perform their identity for a grade. And I'm thinking primarily of students of color. I don't want them I, I'm very aware of my own social location. I'm a white person who's reading. I'm a white person who's grading. And it's problematic um, to require a student to perform their racial identity as a paper assignment. Um, moreover, it's important, um, I don't want students to have to perform their trauma for a grade or share their trauma. Um, if they've been, um, if they've experienced racism, you know, I, I don't want them to feel they have to share that with me or write about it for a grade. 
Um, at the same time, sort of the opposite issue is students um, who've experienced racism or, or racial trauma, I don't want them, I don't want to force them to discuss their experiences as if they're something abstract. And that doesn't, you know, that it's just this abstract thing and it's not about something that they personally have experienced. So there's sort of this, um, you know, on the one hand, I don't want students to have to perform their trauma. On the other hand, I don't want them to have to pretend like it doesn't exist by treating the issue as something that's totally abstract. Um, I don't want to push students into a defensive posture. This is something I think about a lot with, with white students and especially white students who don't realize that they carry with them um, racial biases and that some of their positions are racist. And, um, you know, I want to push them, I want to challenge them, but not to the point that they break down and become defensive or be, you know, just write whatever they think is going to get them a grade. Um, over the years, I think this is one of the hardest things to learn in teaching this. Um, and, and something that's been mentioned in this group before is students hold on to their positions for all kinds of reasons having to do with their own identity, their self-esteem, their family values, um, their background. And, um, and I want to challenge students and at the same time don't don't push I don't want to push them so much that they just become defensive and and don't have any room to grow. Um, I also want to um, I want to make sure that when I'm talking about um, communities of color, that I'm not simply characterizing them in terms of their oppression. Um, that, that when I'm thinking about oppressed communities in general, that I'm giving, I'm also um, showing agency and activism and wisdom and, 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 um, and so that, because I think it's too easy to say, to only talk about is, is issues of racism when you're talking about um, communities, for instance, black communities to only talk about them in terms of the way they've been oppressed and not talk about them in terms of agency or the ways um, they negotiate oppression or um, black joy, you know, all the other aspects of identity. So those are some things I think about. I also want to say, you know, when I'm thinking about students' location, um, something I'm also thinking about is international students. Um, who, because that's very, very tricky. They, they might be new to the, you know, this might be their first year in the United States, or maybe they've lived here 10 years, but they might not be aware of the way racism operates in the United States. And they may be for the first time experiencing themselves in terms of a racial identity. And that's going to create a different set of, um, a, a different kind of orientation. So when I think about strategies to sort of, um, avoid the hazards I mentioned. Um, one is to, as much as possible, decenter whiteness, decenter whiteness in the text. In philosophy, that's really tough. Um, it, Charles Mills says that, uh, that philosophy is the whitest of all the academic disciplines, maybe with the possible exception of classics, like classics and philosophy are sort of battling it out to be the whitest discipline. Um, but it, luckily in the last, you know, 20 years, it's been easier <laughs> to bring in um, non-white voices. Um, the second thing is something um, Marina mentioned in, in one of the first meetings, which is to ground assignments in text. Um, I think that's helpful um, to navigate the, the, the assignments is to ground them in text. Um, a third strategy is to create both high stakes and low stakes assignments. High stakes assignments are ones for a numerical grade and the grade is not insignificant. Um, so they, um, so, so I'm looking for things that are very specific, but then I also have low stakes assignments, which are assignments usually I don't give a letter grade to um, or a numerical grade. Um, they're, they don't impact students' grades very much. And those assignments are more exploratory. Students can take more risks. Um, they, they can, they're, they're, they're uh, more flexible, that kind of thing. The, um, another strategy is I, when I'm, a lot of times I provide options for students with assignments. 
And again, that way I'm not forcing students and I'm really thinking of, of I'm thinking first of all of students of color, not forcing them to share something they don't wanna share, but I'm thinking about white students not pushing them into a defensive posture. And I'll give you an example of both of those things. Um, so give students assignments so they can kind of choose what they want to explore. Um, and and a, a, another strategy I find is helpful, again, because it, it avoids both talking about issues abstractly and also forcing students to talk about their own experiences, um, is to analyze positions, theological and philo philosophical positions mostly, but also sociological positions or historical um, issues um, through the use of memoir or fiction. So, and, and I'll give you some examples of that. And I think that's something a lot of us do. So here is a, um, here's an issue. How does it relate to this person talking about their experience? So I'll give you a couple examples of these kinds of assignments. Um, so regarding looking at um, it, 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 an oppressed community in terms of more than simply their oppression, um, I do this, I usually do this in um, as in an essay uh, on, a, on an exam. So it's an exam question on an essay exam. Um, and it's Kelly Brown Douglas's book that I know a lot of people use. Um, I have a question where it goes something like this. She argues that the Christian religion was what she calls a legitimizing canopy for stand your ground culture. So this notion of religion is legitimizing canopy, but she also argues that black faith provided a counter narrative to Anglo-Saxon exceptional, exceptionalism. So I have students, they have to um, demonstrate both of those arguments through two major points. So what that does is it highlights both the oppression, but it also highlights um, the agency of the oppressed at the same time in the question. Um, regarding using memoir or fiction, I, I sent along um, some resources that, and I haven't, this will be the first time I use this because um, Kathy Park Hong's book is new. I've never used it before. Um, the chapter on the myth of the model minority I've used in the past. Um, but I, I, it, my, my students next paper assignment, they don't know this yet. So mum's the word is um, Chow and Fegan's study of Asian Americans, and they focus on Asian Americans, not simply Asians in the book, the, Mo the myth of the model minority. Um, they say that they move beyond the assimilation approach to a systematic racism um, perspective. And if you've had a chance to read the, the chapter, it's a really good gloss on, um, on the, the way racism presents itself with um, people of Asian descent. You know, it's, it's, it, does a, it does a nice summary. So um, in the paper, they have to take that account of systematic racism and apply it to Kathy Park Hung's um, experiences in United. And United is the essay that I sent. It's a, it's from, um, it's this book. Uh, it's a collection of her own, her own essay. It's a memoir of her own experience being a, a Korean American. Um, and it embodies a lot of what um, Chow and um, Fegan talk about. So again, you're reading a person's experience, so it's not abstract, but students don't have to write about their own experiences. I also find, and I'm sure we all do, that when you um, when you ground ideas in, in narrative and story, it just sticks a lot better. Students remember it, um, it impacts them more, so it's helpful for that reason. So I'm, I've got a couple other examples of um, of assignments that are like that, but I'm going to move on. Regarding assignments, I'm going to give two examples of assignments where I give students a choice. Um, one is an assignment where a lot of what I'm doing with white students is helping them recognize um, their, their privilege, their, their whiteness, and recognizing how that's advantaged them. And in the beginning of the year, um, with my students, I do a lot of work helping them understand their own education in terms of the education gap um, and the history of what created the education gap and why it's racialized. So the geography of race, how that's grounded in, you know, explicitly racist policies and laws um, of the federal government, 
from the 30s and how the legacy of that is reflected in the school system today. So they have a, a, an understanding of that. And, and this year um, in Pulse, we did modules and there's a similar assignment in the module. So the assignment is to write an educational biography that focuses on the ways that structural advantages and or oppression shape your opportunities and experiences. So really what I want students to do, and in particular white students, is think about how their own success is related to is to white supremacy. Um, but a second assignment that I've given in the past, because again, I, students of color often are very aware of this and they might not, it's an assignment that I give the first couple months of school. Students might not, they don't know me very well. Um, so an alternate assignment is I have them read um, a, an article from the Boston Globe series, um, The Great Divide. Um, which talks about the, the racial divide and equities. Um, it also talks about the class divide. Um, but there's an article called Neighboring Schools Worlds Apart, which is fantastic. It, can, it um, compares Newton High School and Brighton High School, Newton North rather, and Brighton High School. And so an alternate assignment is for the student to use that article and identify the ways that institutional racism accounts for the difference in the schools accounts for this gap, this education gap. So that's one example of giving students choice. Um, another example, and here's one where I'm thinking about challenging white students and not wanting them to shut down, is um, there's, a, there's a really, really powerful article that was done by BC Heights years ago called My Presence Here Doesn't Mean Anything. I don't know if you're familiar with it, but it's just a history of how BC has responded to racism, it, it just the history, the black experience at BC and the experience of racism at BC, both of those things. So, and it lists everything from the first time a black student came to BC to um, the uh, black talent program. And it goes up to, I think it ends at 2017. So anyway, um, so the assignment that I think most students are gonna do is after reading this article, identify some of the ways that white privilege operates at Boston College. And it's a way, I, I think it's important as a way for students to see the racism that they're seeing today or the hate crimes they're seeing today to contextualize it in a history. You know, that this stuff is not new. There have been people that have been, um, you know, there have been activists for a long time. Sometimes there's been progress, sometimes there hasn't. So that's, that's the assignment. However, again, for a student, a, a white student who's got a very defensive posture about their racial identity, they're, this is gonna, they're gonna feel like they're forced into doing something they don't wanna do. So the alternate assignment is to read the article and to um, identify some areas where progress has been made and some where there's been a failure of progress regarding racial equity on campus. So it's, it, it allows them to have a more neutral stance. And again, you know, ideally everybody's gonna want to explore the role of white privilege at Boston College, but, but I, don't wanna, I don't wanna, again, create a defensive posture with a certain kind of student with a certain kind of history and a certain set of beliefs that are tied up with their identity and self-esteem, where they're just not going to go there if whether I want them to or not. So I'm I'm going to stop there. Um, and and, and uh, thank thank you, Mary. That's very helpful uh, and very detailed, which helps me, Matt. Sure. Um, so in preparing for this, I was kind of looking over the previous five presentations since I'm going last and uh, thinking, what haven't we covered? Uh, and the thing I, th I thought was most helpful was the uh, addressing the fact that most of you probably don't teach a program like Pulse or a class like Pulse, which gets to talk directly about race. Um, and so what I wanted to talk about is uh, first things you can do to set up or facilitate discussion about race in general, uh, which may not even occur in your classroom, but which are good things to keep in mind. And then second, some integrative assignments you could use in a class which wasn't specifically about uh, race or social justice. Um, so uh, the thing I think is most helpful about this is if you want a classroom that can talk about race and racial issues is to have it be a regular part of your course. And this is not just race, but issues of race, class, gender, uh, social justice in general. 
And so this means making connections between material, which is not on its face about race or does not on its face connect with, uh, you know, American racial issues. Um, and uh, bringing that to mind, highlighting it, maybe spending, you know, two minutes of your lecture on, on a given topic and saying, this is how, this is an implication of this 2000 years later, this is an implication of this down the line, but uh, it sets up an opportunity for people to start thinking and start making connections across uh, time periods. So uh, as an example of this, uh, when I'm teaching Aristotle, for example, we do kind of basic Nicomachean ethics and we're talking about what is a human? A uh, human is a, a rational animal, an animal who reasons. Uh, that sounds like a perfectly normal and uninteresting pretty much definition of what a person is, but it has lots of implications, especially if you say, what, uh, what happens if this human is not rational? Or what happens if this human is not rational in the way that we want them to be or the way that we define reason? Um, this has major implications for Aristotle, right? Uh, it's the way he uses uh, to justify slavery. So he thinks um, it's objectionable to own people or to direct people who have reason. But if there's a class of people who are ineffective in their reasoning or unable to reason for themselves, that would justify governance uh, of them by somebody else. And this uh, actually is one of the justifications used for slavery many, uh, many millennia later. Uh, in the American context as well, uh, as the same structure of the argument. Um, these people are not sufficiently rational. They cannot think for themselves. Uh, this requires governance. So, you know, I'm taking somebody from ancient Greece and I'm talking about uh, things which foreground or play a role in eventually uh, the American context. Um, and you can do this, I think, with a lot of different texts and a lot of different, uh, you can do this with scripture, you can do this with philosophy, especially, um, but the, the thing to pay attention to is kind of what are the implications of this theory of the human or the person or who is good, who is left out, uh, why are they left out, and how can this be misused down the line? Um, good. All right. That's the first thing. Um, a second kind of related idea is a question of who is a text written for, and this is something you can also highlight when you're talking about historical Aristotle is another good example of this, that he's writing specifically for, for the most part, you know, a male audience who is uh, directed towards uh, the ruling class. He's trying to educate people for politics, men for politics. Um, that, that's the goal of his, of his writing. And so we can ask what perspective is left out of this text? Who is missing from it? Uh, would things change? Would things uh, be different if uh, Aristotle was writing for women? Um, or if women were, women's voices were included in Aristotle's thought, uh, which I think actually Aristotle compared to many of the ancient Greeks is not as bad on women as, as it can get. So there's, there's some modifications there, but uh, it's still a, a question to ask of this text uh, and a question to ask of all texts. So audience and uh, subsequent implications. Um, on a similar note too, uh, it's important to choose authors uh, kind of whether as primary sources or as secondary sources who are uh, represent voices, uh, who are underrepresented voices, uh, including people of color in your course in a variety of ways. So this can be something as simple as like, you know, you're doing a Bible class, uh, you find a person of color who has a supplementary article written on a topic uh, of this. And uh, simply by including voices from people of color, you are making a a shift from, as, as kind of Mary put it, the, the whiteness of our discipline. Um, and there, that article from that person of color does not have to be about race. It does not have to be all the time a person of color speaks about race and racial issues. In fact, that's probably ideally not the case. Um, uh, likewise, uh, it's important not to have, uh, you know, a, a, Kate, uh, a class which only has a section on race and that's the only time where racial issues are discussed that you create this kind of like, oh, right, well, this is the time of the semester where we are concerned with black people's voices, but the rest of the semester, we just don't, we're not worried about that sort of thing. Uh, the message of that is not really helpful. So uh, an inclusive syllabus uh, will also facilitate discussion of race and racial issues uh, merely through representation. Um, good, all right. Uh, Next, uh, something else we can do in our classrooms is make connection between thinkers, which 
may be considered unconventional or uh, maybe not considered straightforward. Um, so we often see, or quite often see, um, uh, or think of uh, a kind of a, a grouping that there's thinkers on race and then there's thinkers on philosophy or there's thinkers on kind of the human self and then there's thinkers on uh, class and gender. Uh, and so we draw this hard dividing line between these two areas as if they're separate disciplines. But by including um, uh, or making connections and showing that uh, this is kind of what Mary was talking about with, uh, it's not just about being oppressed or it's not just about racial injustice. There's about a certain experience, a certain creative expression, a certain uh, contribution, which is made by uh, people of color, which is often overlooked and which is equal to and uh, essential to uh, philosophical and theological thinking. Uh, and therefore you can put them alongside uh, of each other. Uh, so an example of this, I ended up writing a paper um, that was published recently that uh, was based off a connection I saw in my class, which was between uh, Kierkegaard and uh, W.E.B. Du Bois on the, the question of uh, Kierkegaard's concept of, of despair and Du Bois's concept of double consciousness. And they're both actually rooted in Hegel's idea of the unhappy consciousness. And so uh, what I did in the class for a couple of years before writing that paper was to, to compare Du Bois's description of the consciousness of black persons based off of black experience, as he talks about in the souls of black folk, with uh, Kierkegaard's uh, description of consciousness of the Christian in um, in the sickness unto death. Uh, and so you're making a connection between two descriptions of consciousness, but it becomes, and Kierkegaard is obviously pretty much unfamiliar with race or anything uh, current in that sense, but you can challenge his text and challenge the reading of his text by including uh, Du Bois's voice voice uh, and by putting these texts alongside each other. So I'm not treating Kierkegaard as a separate section uh, from Du Bois, but rather including Du Bois as uh, an interlocutor, an equal interlocutor with uh, Kierkegaard. Uh, a similar connection I did in, in my uh, class uh, this year, especially, which kind of people were kind of, I don't know, blown away by this, but I used uh, Kanye West's movie Runaway, which I don't know if anybody's ever seen this. Um, uh, out um, and uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson's uh, two two of his works, Nature and Circles, and in particular, Kanye's movie has a circular notion of the creative process, and it connects extremely well with Emerson's notion of circles. So, uh, making these kind of uh, connections allows students to think through uh, race and questions of race, and also uh, people of color just contributing to philosophical understanding and theological understanding in a way that uh, perhaps white students have never experienced. Um, and so you're including voices which uh, need to be included and that can again facilitate discussion. Um, finally on that, uh, on the note of integrative assignments, um, I, I always assign papers with multiple options to give students ways of essentially avoiding having to write about themselves. But um, one of the things that you can do is to um, offer us options on assignments where issues of race, class, and gender are not immediately apparent. But you can say, what, what is the racial significance of this doctrine? What is the class significance of this doctrine? What is the significance for thinking of gender of this, this doctrine, of this philosophical thought, of this theological argument, whatever. Um, and that way you have uh, students making connections between, again, texts which may not on their surface uh, be about this, these matters, but can help students think through these things and they can start to make connections uh, uh, for themselves. Uh, other assignments would be to link figures, uh, like I talked about with uh, Kanye and Emerson and uh, Du Bois and Kierkegaard. And um, yeah, uh, I think that's the other one. That's what, yeah, that's it for me. Um, so just kind of these, uh, a, an approach to your class, which says race is not something we're going to talk about when we are forced to because of a traumatic issue. And race is not something we're going to talk about only in the section on race, which is towards the end of the semester. But rather a consciousness of race, of racial implications, of different epistemologies, of all these kinds of different ways of understanding, if employed throughout the semester, uh, can greatly facilitate discussion over the course of the year. Great. Thanks, Matt. Thank you both, Mary and Matt. 
I, let me open, open up with the question. I had a very odd experience last year uh, in an undergraduate class. And I don't know if Mary or Matt or any of you have had, ever had anything like this. We were talking about race. We were reading W.E.B. Du Bois. Uh, and, um, you know, things were on the rails, pretty, you know, the veil, double consciousness, and yada, yada. But I had an Asian American student who very much objected to being considered a person of color. Uh, she did. <laughs> I mean, she, she bristled at the idea that she was part of a racial minority, uh, which for, um, uh, I can only speculate as to why she did that. But I thought it was a very odd moment. And I think the class, the class had about 21 students. The class was divided in response to this. It was a very odd kind of thing. And half of them were saying, no, you, you are in fact a racial minority. And the other half, who I think had a very socioeconomic understanding of what a minority status is. Well, of course, Asian Americans aren't minority students, that sort of thing. Have any of you ever encountered it? I mean, it was so outside the box that I wasn't quite, I sort of had to come home, take a shot, take a, take a scotch and go to bed for about 45 minutes. Like, what was, what was that all about? I mean, so have, you, have any of you ever encountered anything like that? Short answer, no, but uh, I've seen, uh, I've had students who say that they've never, I think Mary mentioned this too, that they've never thought of themselves as being a race and including Asian students who had never thought of having an identity in race. And um, you know, I actually had one student just wrote a paper kind of about uh, their sense of identity was more related to being a New Yorker than to being uh, Asian American. Um, and uh, so their consciousness has increased as violence has increased and required it. But um, it's, I think, <laughs> I never had anybody be standoffish about it. So I don't have any advice on that front, but it is a, it is an interesting thing. Okay, I, I didn't mean to hijack the conversation. So uh, comments or, or responses. Let me ask both Mary and Matt this question. Um, do you find certain I'm just going to racialize minority groups here. Um, certain students from certain racial groups are more willing or less willing to talk about where they stand vis-a-vis -vis sort of whiteness and white privilege. Um, in terms, in terms of, is it easier with some groups and not with other groups? I mean, I, for instance, I, I, I understand. But the white students, the vast majority of my students are, are white middle class kids. And they divide, they don't, they don't, they do not go into one group easily. They're all over the place. Um, so what do you do about addressing this when you have students from different racial backgrounds? Or do you? Yeah, I, yeah, I, um, it's something I think about a lot. And um, I find, for instance, when I teach about the myth of the model minority, my Asian students tend to look down through the whole class. When I teach about racism regarding Black Americans, my Black students put their heads down, and rightly so, because if you're in a class that's predominantly white, there's a lot of room for things to go wrong. There's a lot of room to be, um, to be for microaggressions, um, there's, and, and even if I try to create a safe classrooms, they have experiences from other classrooms that they're bringing in. Um, so, and the other thing is that, you know, if you think about intersectionality, a student is never simply their race and they're bringing their whole social location. And so, if they, if a student feels like they have to talk about themselves in terms of their race, it doesn't capture who they are. So, um, so I, it, if I were to make a generalization, I would say no white students are the only ones who feel like they, they feel comfortable talking about it in, in the sense that it's a much safer conversation for them. You know, they are, they are not going to get hurt in the same way. Um, and so, it, you know, it, things people have talked about before, you try to create everything in the classroom so that 
again, so a student doesn't have to represent their whole race. So they don't have to make sure that they're, you know, assume that their experience is typical or whatever. So it's, um, yeah, it's, it's, I think it's just a fraught convert. It's part of white privilege that it's all, you know, white people talk about it very freely and think that they're the ones having a hard time talking about it. Uh, yeah, similar experience. Uh, there's always a range of student responses, uh, even within groups, especially um, one of the things I've, I think I've had not, not an equal number, but a, a, a relatively proportional number of, you know, even like black students who would start this, start the year without, you know, a, what you would call like a woke consciousness or something like that. Uh, and we'll write about how people need to work harder uh, and so on and so forth in their responses. And then by the end of the year, uh, they're writing different things about uh, about race and, and developing a kind of a greater understanding. Um, and so there's just a lot of students that's kind of like, that's the American narrative is just like you work hard and you get ahead and um, then you actually study it and that's not what that's not what's going on. Um, so <laughs> it is a good, I think uh, Megan put it very well that you can kind of, you sometimes need to presume a, a level of innocence across the board for students on all these issues. Um, and you'll find that there's a range of students who are m much better informed. Uh, but even then you can't make judgments about um, students based off of, of racial categories about how, how much they know about anything um, or even what their position on anything is, so. I don't wanna say anything, but Lisa has had her hand up and I have my hand up, so okay, I don't know. Go, go, go ahead, just go ahead. Lisa, go ahead. You're muted. You're muted. Marianne, you go ahead. Thank you. Well, no, my question, it might be really silly, but okay. Um, I, I appreciate the comments and the, I, the strategies and, and these ideas. Um, I'm teaching remotely, completely. So I never see, I'm not in the classroom. And I find that to have discussions about questions like this are really hard. I mean, you, you see the tops of their heads, they're twirling their hair, some roommate walks by. Um, it's very distracting. And I just want to know if anybody has had any any ways of uh, overcoming this. Um, last semester, I used Brian Massingale. This is a course, uh, core course in theology, engaging Catholicism. I used Brian Massingale's um, racism in the Catholic church. And I I didn't, I used it in the very beginning because I, um, I don't know, there was something going on on campus and I thought we're gonna, we were gonna talk about it at the end of the semester sort of in this one segment, but I wanted to introduce it early. And, and actually uh, that worked well. The, the final exam, my TA got COVID and I had 36 kids and I just couldn't handle all of this correcting that was gonna be due at the end. So I basically, um, streamed the final down, it was a take home kind of thing, to doing, uh, Massengale was very critical of the US bishops uh, and what they had said officially about racism. And so right during this class, actually, they uh, this newer um, statement had come out from the US bishops on racism. I forget the name of it, actually. So I gave them at that text as the exam and said, okay, compared to what you've read about Mass Massengill's critiques, is this any better um, from whatever perspective they might want to come at it? Uh, so that worked great because that was a take home exam. But what I, I find in discussions, I, I mean, it, it's my insecurity. I don't know what they're thinking. I can't see them. Um, you know, all of a sudden I get a, a chat message. Oh, my internet has, you know, is unstable or whatever, all these distracting things. So I just wanna know, how do you overcome, have you, if you are teaching remotely, how to have a discussion on, a, on topics like this that are serious and uncomfortable and everything else when you're looking at a grid of faces? I mean, if you have any experience doing it that you found a, uh, you know, something that works, I'm really eager to hear it. Jeff, you can say something. Yeah. So my my experience in in, in getting people to talk and uh, you're right, the grid of 38 is very difficult to get people to volunteer for all the reasons you said. Um, that's been my experience. But what I found is that if you give them kind of opportunities to rehearse the conversation before they get to the large group, it kind of builds confidence and gives them kind of uh, you know material to work with that they're confident with. 
So you can do that by, it, it, obviously you need, if you have time to prepare ahead of time, you can have them meeting in small groups outside of class or writing very, very short assignments where they think about something outside of class that then they've already rehearsed it outside of class and they can talk about it in class. The alternative is if you want to just do it kind of ad hoc while you're in class is to send them into small breakout rooms uh, and, and force them to talk to each other in groups of like four, uh, you know, three or four um, and, and then have someone basically report because then they've had the time to rehearse the, the question and come back and I just actually had this experience the, the, the comment that I had before um, uh, talking about how you envision God, I would never have gotten that in simply um, a, a big open discussion in class because I've asked that question to big open groups of folks in class and I've never gotten anything like that. We rehearsed it in a small group of discussion outside of class. Then we had small group discussions with different groups of people inside of class. And then we came to the large room and that's when it came out. That was at the beginning of the semester. I just had a very similar experience in the last class that I had where we had small groups and then we came together and people were actually, uh, people were actually able to talk. But you gotta, it, it takes up a lot of class time to do stuff like that. Um, but that's been my experience with trying to get folks to talk about hard stuff. Well, no, thank you. Um, obviously I do do breakouts, you know, for, and in, for just that, way that you describe for that reason. But I find when they come together, it's all of a sudden, I mean, again, unless you have explicitly said, all right, first thing to do is have somebody be the one that's going to report on the conversation or something like that. Um, I don't know. I, I think it might be possible to integrate some writing assignment with it, very short kind of thing and use, I forget now what the technique, there's some kind of canvas thing that you can use besides the discussion board. Although I do use the discussion board and find that that's a good way of prompting uh, and, and uh, preparing for these, these kind of conversations. But I still, I guess, when we come back to the whole group, um, except for the people that are gonna report, you don't really know what's going on exactly. And, if, and these classes are too large. I'm sorry, I, I'm talking to the, this is ridiculous. Pulse, you know, you, you, you're lucky. You, you, what do you have, 15, 20 people? I've got 36 or 38 kids. It's, it's wrong. And I think we should lobby to get this changed, frankly, but I'm on, Probably like my sunset cruise, so. <laughs> That's why I divided my class in half. So I have only half of them at, at each session and then I did all the rest of it asynchronously. Lisa, you had your hand up earlier. Yeah, um, this is actually going back a ways uh, to what you, Mark, said about the Asian American student who didn't recognize that, I think you said it was a she, I'm not sure, but yeah, he correct. was a minority. And then to what Jeff said about Asian students not having reflected before on the fact that their image of God was white. And my comment is that all of us imbibe the cultural messages that we're embedded in and to speak to Jeff's experience, there's a book by a feminist theologian, Elizabeth Johnson, that has a bunch of images of God, like pictures of art uh, that would actually apply to what you're talking about, Jeff, but it's, it's images of the Trinity. And they're all three white men or two white men and a bird. And when you look at them all together, you kind of go, oh my God, I never thought of it like that before. And you mean the really Trinity is not two white guys and a bird? Wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's some non-traditional ones in there too, but it's really interesting for students, like even grad students to just like see that in front of them. Uh, and then, you know, you realize. Uh, but on the issue of the student who didn't recognize that she was a minority, um, and, and this also connects with one of the assigned readings that came from Mary, I think, which was on the topic that I'm about to mention. But I shared with my students this semester the content of an article that had been written by one of our doctoral students who's now been out for a while, who's Asian American. And it's, and it's on the way the myth of the model minority is used to divide uh, people of color so that 
uh, they don't create a critical mass. And the basic idea is that the Asian people are like honorary whites as long as they meet the criteria of the model minority. So Asian people then are sort of induced to feel superior to and separate from black people who are the minorities. And uh, I shared this in class and two of the Asian students in the class said exactly. And in fact, one had written his weekly paper exactly on that topic. So she may have been in a culture where she was taught in her family or whatever church she belonged to, whatever, you know, that Asians are not people of color. People of color are black people and recent immigrants or Latinos. Um, and I just, I wanted to just share one other thing. This is actually an expression of gratitude. Uh, something that I tried that worked really well that Marina recommended in the first session of this. And um, Marina said, if, when you're going to introduce race as a topic, it's good to acknowledge your own vulnerability and say, you know, this could be an awkward discussion and I'm not expecting everybody to tell their own story unless they want to, but, you know. And so I, I did that the week before we were going to discuss race and said, you know, so we have these readings for next week. And, um, you know, I'm a white professor. We're in a majority white class, although, the, the class is almost half uh, people of color. It's a small elective seminar. Um, so I think that went really well. Then they felt maybe more at ease and just expressing their points of view. Um, also something that I found that worked well is to have on the assigned readings, some just newspaper clippings or recent essays on incidents of racism and violence that have occurred. I also have, you know, theoretical and theological articles uh, uh, on the syllabus, but I, I had an article, um, I think it was an article from the Globe on the incident in the dorm earlier this semester uh, against uh, women of color in the multicultural learning dorm and then it had a lot of uh, student reactions that my students could then react to. I had another article about violence against Asian Americans that had just recently occurred with some photographs and reactions to that. So I think both my grounding it the way Marina had recommended and then giving them something specific that wasn't necessarily them and their experience to, to get it off the ground um, that was more effective, or it was effective. I don't know more than what, but you know, it was pretty effective. So thank you. Um, I want Mary. I wanted to thank you uh, for your ideas about using narrative, and it makes me think I should use narrative more in my classes. And I was wondering if you and uh, I do it to a degree, but I think you do it more, and I would like to do it more often after listening to you more. Do you have thoughts about what kinds of narratives are more helpful or less helpful for students? Because I could imagine, um, you know, some types of narrative forms being more or less helpful, like more traumatizing or less traumatizing. Do you have suggestions on like how we would go about doing that? I also wanted to say, Mary Ann, you know, I have two pulse discussion sections, 13 each. Um, so the 26 we have are divided up into 213. And every Monday, um, one of my classes is super talky about this stuff and like just going on and on and on and really wonderful. And the other same professor, same text, same everything is just really quiet. So it may not be anything you're doing. It can sometimes just be, you know, the, the luck of the draw with what, how tired your students are after lunch or something like that. So, but Mary, Matt, do you have thoughts about that? Yeah, um, I, I guess the the one thing I would say, yeah, it's a great question, is um, thinking about the narratives. I tend to use narratives where I guess I stay away from stuff that's re really traumatizing. And and again, I, I try to find narratives where the person who's speaking has a lot of authority. So for instance, something I'm using this year, it's new, so I haven't used it. I've also not used it before, is an article from um, Jer Jared Walker. Is Jared Walker? Gerald Walker's um, How to Make a Slave. It's called The Heritage Room. And it's his experience as an academic, as a professor, 
he gets in an argument with a woman in his department and, um, and she basically says he's being violent and aggressive and that he raised his voice when he clearly didn't. Um, so students can unpack that, but in a way, but it, it's not the, it, what's clear is things like privileging the, the, the experience of the white person, you know, the white person privileging their own experience and dismissing his experience. And he's a professor, you know, so it's, um, so what, again, what I, what, what I'm thinking of narratives, I, I, again, I use a lot of, um, a lot of memoir, but they're not memoir like like a slave narrative, which I think has a place and is really helpful. But but it's super intense. And again, I, I'm trying to get away from just looking at persons of color in terms of their oppression. So it, 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 in the ones I've used, they're kind of complex because, it, for instance, in this one, it's his experience as an academic, it's his, his experience as a colleague. It's the experience in general of just being an academic and what a pain it is, you know? So it's, there's a lot going on. It's not simply about, about oppression. So, um, you know, the, the, one from, um, the, the one from Minor Feelings, you know, part of it is just about being in the Iowa Poetry Workshop, like just, just being a poet and, you know, it's, so it, it's, they're about a lot of things, um, so. I don't know if that answers your question, but. Just really quickly to add, uh, I like using accounts of accounts. So instead of first person narrative accounts, use stuff like evicted or stuff like that, which is the kind of sociological retelling of stories. And I think that uh, does the nice balance of getting in depth, but also not overwhelming students. Um, and they definitely, those. that's always the book that students remember most that are stuff like Amazing Grace and so on and so forth. So um, it's not as direct, but it does, does work sometimes. Yeah, I have used Evicted. I usually make my students read something in August and that's helpful to go back to, especially before they start their service. So um, that's a great book. Thank you. Thank you all for this discussion. It's been really um, helpful and enlightening and I've especially appreciated the stories that you all have shared uh, from your students. Um, and that with the model minority reading that we had, I think um, it's really helped me to understand or start not to understand, but to see the ways in which, you know, the story of Asians and Asian Americans is, you know, that history is its own history and the need to resist the urge to kind of, to see the, the ways in which it has been part of the racial story in America as whiteness and persons of color and also to stay mindful of the ways in which it has been its own story and to resist the urge to kind of shoehorn this into Americans, a uh, white black dynamic. So thank you for that. It's been really interesting and instructive, but a, a bit of a practical question on after that. Um, Mary, at the beginning yeah. of your presentation, you had talked about um, using assignments in ways that uh, uh, prevented asking your students to either in discussions or in written assignments to act out their either their racial identities or their racial traumas um, as part of the assignment uh, and I, I sort of heard you say that you use um, written assignments in one way and discussion assignments in another way to help um, insulate students from that need and I was just wondering if you could say something more specific about how you do that if there's a different way you do that for written assignments, or if you use written assignments in one way to do that and discussions in another way. Or... Oh, oh yeah. Um, well, for instance, if I think of a question like, you know, what what is your, I don't know, having a discussion, I, I'm much more willing to ask questions in a, in a general discussion when we're talking about racism that invites students to think about their own experiences and talk about their own experiences. And, um, and I think that's fine because again, if it's a, if it's a student of color who has experienced things, I make it very clear that nobody, that they don't have to, you know, that they don't have to talk, that they don't have to represent, you know, their, their race to the class. So um, students can talk in ways they can choose what they share and what they don't share. The problem is in an assignment, 
you want to, you know, or you want to get an A, it's much more rigid. So I could imagine a student feeling pressure to share something that they don't necessarily feel comfortable sharing because they care about their grade as, as every BC student does. So, um, so for instance, yeah, like what's going on on campus, the racial, um, the, the incidence of racism on campus, like the MLE floor, I'm, I'm sorry, that's my, my bird alarm, my bird uh, clock. Um, I, 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 we talk about it in class and we talk, we, we've talked about it, you know, routinely, but I'm, I'm not going to have them write assignments about because uh, about it so that a student who's on the ML E floor has to talk about her experience for a grade. So that would be a, a difference. Um, a way where I'm more willing to do things with, in a general discussion, a loose discussion, than I'm willing to do in a written assignment. We have time for one last question. Would anyone like to get the last, uh, the last hurrah? I think Lisa has her hand. Oh, Lisa. Okay. I'm sorry. I'm done. I should have taken it down. I'm just listening. Thank you. Okay. I want to thank uh, Mary and Matt today. Thank you. This has been very interesting and very helpful. And I also want to thank uh, all of our speakers, uh, Marina and Megan, are here today. Uh, this has been, for me, a very important and exciting uh, series of discussions about how to address a really crucial question. And the longer I'm at Boston College, I realize that um, this is very much a concern that Boston College, that we as part of the Boston College community have to address because we seem to have some problems here some serious problems that are embedded in our identity we have to do. I also want to thank um, my friend Ruth Langer, who um, we said, what should we do? She immediately said, well, we should do a series of seminars on race in the classroom, of course. And she was, as is always, I've learned, she's always right on this thing. So I immediately, I did the proper response, like, you're right, we should do that. So thank you, Ruth, for doing this. I have a feeling this will, in some form or another, this will continue. Uh, into the in the fall semester and we'll have another conversation about this and last uh, by no means least i want to thank susie richard who i would say whatever works technologically at boston college is directly due to susan richard so thank you because uh, those of you who know me i'm a, know i'm a real class when it comes to technology stuff so thank you susie uh, i wish all of you a um a peaceful and uneventful final 28 days of the semester we have a month left here uh, may nothing interesting happen to you during that time, uh, and hopefully you'll get some well-deserved rest at the end of the at the end of the semester. So thank you all, and take good care. Okay. Thank you to Mark and Ruth also for starting this. So I'm very appreciative. So thank you both. Surely. Bye bye everybody. Dad, if you have if you have specific ideas of ways to carry this forward, uh, please be in touch with Mark or me, and because we have the the resources and to just try to get something mobilized uh, that we can have you know, conversations about how to make our work better. So that, that's an excellent idea. Also, also like either building on this or a completely different way of having a faculty conversation about the classroom. Uh, that would be very helpful to us. So. Thanks everybody. Take care.